Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. So, let's have a look. Let's start with an orchestra, shall we? Um, orchestras consist of many different instruments, and they all have to play the same tune. And um, I think one thing that we know about biomarker discovery is that it's a pipeline, well, mixing metaphors, it's a pipeline. Everybody has to be playing the same tune, and you have to be working together in order to get the end product, which is beautiful and useful. So I think in terms of biomarker protein development, one of the positions that I'm going to put to you today is that it's not really been that way, and we need to improve things, and that's why we built the Stoller Biomarker Discovery Centre. So the outline of my talk is about discovery and precision medicine. Secondly, I'll talk about industrialising proteomic mass spectrometry in respect of data acquisition and analysis, which is the Stoller Centre. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done with proteomics just to show that it has a degree of utility. So we've uh, all seen this diagram, uh, well, this kind of diagram very often. And uh, in respect of regulatory authorities, etc., what we need to be doing is to consider the biomarkers, the companion diagnostics, and indeed the mechanisms to satisfy those regulatory authorities so that we can engage in this stratification and give uh, a therapy suited to an individual rather than a one-size-fits-all type of approach. And coming from a background in, in leukemia research, obviously uh, I can say that stratification can work in diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia, for example, and then treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So uh, the point of this talk, therefore, is to concentrate on biomarkers and the, the development of companion diagnostics and to address some of the problems that are associated with the generation of such biomarkers. The... This is, this is a paper that, that I put up in a very great many of my uh, presentations because it essentially goes through quite a lot of the difficulties that one has. And if I just select out a few of them, which I've done um, by using bold type here, so these difficulties are around getting to the end product, getting to the biomarker that you wish to use and which is essential if we're going to move towards... Um, towards a precision med med medicine strategies. So the lack of awareness and knowledge on added value of companion diagnostics was identified as one problem. Information communication technology, information gathering generally, and uh, I think we heard a bit about that this morning. And um, on top of that, I think collection of appropriate samples for um, later use is... Um, problematic, as well as accessibility to such samples. Lack of translation, that adds up to a lack of translation of companion diagnostics or biomarkers. And if we look at that in a different way, then we can see that in terms of, um, in terms of biomarker publications, then they go up and up and up, and people like me can contribute papers to proteomics journals, and um, they'll get a few citations, but they don't really make any difference to healthcare practice, which isn't necessarily a good thing. And um, the number of patents is, is uh, bobbing along on the bottom there as well. If you look at other papers on biomarkers, then you can see that it takes about 12 years to generate a biomarker, which would, in this case, be a proteinaceous biomarker. Then you look at George Post's paper, which says, uh, this, this is quite old now, this is 2011, but his stats were essentially 150,000 papers on biomarkers and about 100 biomarkers routinely used in the clinic. So the translation of observations around potential biomarkers is just not happening to any great degree for all the reasons that the previous paper described and if you then go to Lee Anderson, Lee Anderson's a, a proteomics guy who thinks deeply about these things. If you then go to his figure from his paper, not mine, um, then you can see that the number of new proteins available for use in clinical decision-taking 
is flatlining, even with all these wonderful new technologies that we've got. So we need to change that. And as I intimated, that's why we, we um, developed the Stoller Biomarker Discovery Centre. The other thing about measuring proteins is that you can get a false discovery. So an antibody doesn't necessarily bind to just one thing. It can bind to a, um, a litany of different things, and that means that you're getting false discovery. And this one is a, is a good example with respect to the well-known CA125 cancer antigen and another protein. So one needs to be extremely careful about the platform that one is using. There's always a clinical clinical imperative to measure something, but sometimes you just might not be measuring the right thing. One of the adverts that, uh, let's call it an advert, or one of the academic points, maybe, is a better phrase, that I want to make is that you can deal with this with, uh, with mass spectrometry and proteomics. So um, my background isn't in mass spectrometry and proteomics, so I feel I'm allowed to say this. The fact is that if you use a mass spectrometer properly, then you absolutely know that what you are measuring is the chemical entity that you wish to measure. And this is um, exemplified in this work, which was really led by Rob Moritz out of, of Seattle which generated a, a huge peptide atlas, which enables you to go online and find the appropriate mass spectrometry characteristics of a specific uh, peptide and therefore protein that you want to be looking at. And these, these guys, Lee Hood, Rudy Abersold, Rob Moritz, concentrated on proteotypic peptides, peptides that are only found in one specific protein. There is not a benchtop mass spectrometer, but in the next 10 years we might get there. And then this is going to help us to identify and also uh, use um, uh, proteinaceous biomarkers more effectively with less false positives, uh, greater sensitivity, and so forth. The, I, hear, I, am, I am here talking about proteins by invitation, but I know that there are... <laughs> many other entities that are worth measuring. And, um, and so we heard, we heard about metabolites in, in the previous eloquent talk. And coming from a, a cancer background, obviously circulating tumor DNA, RNA, are things that, that are of value in that particular field. And I'm really interested in vesicles and exosomes and what they may hold for us when you isolate them from, from uh, peripheral blood. So, what is our centre? Uh, our centre funded was funded by about £16 million pounds from um, Medical Research Council, and we've topped that up with industry funding, etc. And uh, we got some money from uh, Sir Norman Stoller as well. It's, it now sits as being the largest clinical proteomics centre in Europe, with um, more mass spectrometers than most people, by some margin, in respect to proteomics at least. And one of, the, one of the, the pictures that we made to uh, Medical Research Council was that the Fire Institute was extremely active in Manchester, and we would link everything that we did to the Healthy Research Centre slash Fire Institute so that we could take forward research more effectively from a good uh, uh, electronic healthcare record base and so forth. We also decided from from the ground up, and we literally did build this centre from shelled out space, um, to have good clinical practice in place so that we could deal with that thing that I showed you, the low throughput of new biomarkers in respect to um, uh, protein measurements in, in blood and so on. So the centre does not just do discovery. Um, one needs to get onto the business of biomarker verification validation, and all of those are built into our capabilities in the space that, that, we, um, that we have, which sits um, really between the university and the Central Manchester Foundation Trust. Health informatics is important in this respect, and so is NHS pathology. So, so part of the 16 million, 3 million, is um, for a um, 
uh, Molecular Pathology Innovation Centre, which is the PI on that is Tony Fremont, a card-carrying uh, pathologist. And um, he and Catherine Boylan, who are in the audience, so who is in the audience, is, is uh, they are very much concerned with taking whatever we discover and taking um, new tests that come out of industry and getting them into NHS pathology labs, which is, of course, what pathology innovation centres are about. And it's a very difficult job. And I think in, in the first year of, of the, their existence, they're... They've done some really good work in that respect. So we have the STOLA Centre, and this has to sit within the context of patients. It has to sit within the context of NICE and other regulatory authorities. Fortunately, Tony Fremont is very involved in NICE committees. And then on top of that, if you're going to have a proper ecosystem that takes things forward much more rapidly than has been found to be the case in past years, then you need to add on collaboration with industry, you need to add on a capability to look at uh, bolting on genomics to whatever algorithm you might want to generate with respect to protein measurements. You need your advanced informatics and you will need partnerships such as the ones we have with SciEx, Courage and, and other companies. So all of that gives you the capability to take forward uh, the development of, of um, biomarkers more effectively. And then you need a lot of equipment, so that is demonstrated on this slide. And we, we built in a huge amount of IT infrastructure. We, we generate terabytes of data per machine per day. And um, I'm really pleased to tell you that the kind of files that we deal with can be processed in a matter of a couple or three minutes these days. And uh, in other labs, that would take about 12 hours. So that is not a bottleneck for us. It's a bottleneck for many other places. And there's the Pathology Innovation Center. So we can move forward with that. And we have to, we have to go to best practice. And you can find this, obviously, in, in industry and these kinds of uh, approaches. The, the design control guidance for a medical device published 1997 still holds true. What, what do you need? How do you discover it? How do you follow it up so that it's actually statistically significant and uh, going to be valuable in that respect? And then, for me, one of the key parts about this Stoller Biomarker Discovery Center is that it isn't just saying, okay, let's all use mass spectrometers because they're big and shiny. What we need to do is actually turn things into assays that people use. So if it's immunohistochemistry, if it's an ELISA assay, it'll get used. If you say, start using selected reaction monitoring mass spectrometry, everybody turns off. And in, in that sense, I'll give you an example later on of what we did around ovarian cancer and markers for risk of ovarian cancer. We turned mass spectrometry platform into ELISA assays. So, the other thing that we told Medical Research Council is that, that there was a disruptive technology out there. In the bit of work I did on chronic myeloid leukemia that I'm going to tell you about, it took about 30 hours to run a CML primitive cell sample. And you just don't get a very good throughput if you're running a sample for 30 hours. With this new technique, and I'm deliberately not going to cover what SWOT MS is to any, in any great um, depth, you can generate a really good digitized proteomic version of a sample in about three hours. It's because of its uh, completely different, it's a completely different way of doing mass spectrometry. So that is what we sold to Medical Research Council, and that is what we do. And essentially, this is the bit where I, I, I said I wasn't going to explain it, so uh, I'm not going to explain it, as I said, to any, in any great depth. Normally, what you do in proteomics is you cut your proteins into peptides with enzymes, and then you use a bit of the mass spectrometer to select a specific peptide, and you put more energy into it, it falls apart, and then you can tell what that peptide was. And you don't do that with SWATH. 
You just let everything go through the machine. You get a mixture of peptides going into the machine, into the collisional-induced decomposition chamber, and you bash them all up at the same time. And you've made yourself a reference library, and that reference library enables you to deconvolve that signal and find out which peptides were present at any one swathe, and so this would be a swathe of the sample as it comes off of the liquid chromatography apparatus. And this digitized proteome here, uh, you can go back and refer to it time and time again and look for new things that uh, you might want to look at. So the guy in the front row here did a really good talk on diabetes, didn't he? So if we did loads of proteomic digitized swath maps for him, then we could go looking for new signals, couldn't we? And we'll go and do that together, won't we? Because I loved, I loved Dundee. Yeah, I noticed. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. The other thing that I like about this method is that you put what, call, what are called index retention time peptides into each sample. And so MRC were keen that we concentrate on inflammatory disease. That's fine. We'll run serum plasma from inflammatory disease, decently run uh, clinical research. But at the same time, given my um, base at Christie Hospital, I want to be running cancer samples. And uh, so in theory, we should be able to compare inflammatory disease samples with cancer samples because everything can be normalized with these index retention time peptides. And I think that could be incredibly powerful for us. So, the, uh, this slide reappears because I want to make the point that there's an orthogonal mass spectrometry technique to the SWOT MS called SRM that you go to to validate your observations. You don't have to go immediately to try and buy an antibody to confirm what you've seen with your mass spec you can do it with this different mass spectrometry technique. So what we did was to take high-end technology, stick it into the uh, old uh, Manchester Eye Hospital, Royal Manchester Eye Hospital, was it? Um, and we have a series of cohorts that we're working on. Uh, the, bot the, the middle two are MRC Stratified Medicine Program grants, uh, the top one is uh, one that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And UK Biobank down at the bottom, that's basically something I want to do and something we haven't got money to do at the moment. And then we get into the informatics, don't we? Because we don't want to just be looking at proteins. What we want to be looking at is proteins within the context of endotypic data, genomic data, and then the proteomic data. And then with people from uh, the FAR Institute and others, we need to be processing that data using machine learning and coming out with predictive outcomes and patient stratification in a virtuous circle between the health service and health science. And as I said, Tony Fremont, the pathologist, is going to help us do that. And of course, you don't rule out industry in any of that, do you? Because they have to be partners in this process. So the two examples in the, yeah, I've got time to talk about these two examples. So UK CTOX, the PI on, on UK CTOX was, was um, and probably still is, Ian Jacobs, who came to Manchester as dean for, for a little while and introduced us to his UK CTOX um, program grants where there were serial prospective samples from 50,000 women collected over about 10 years, and some of these women went on to develop ovarian cancer. They also went on to develop other diseases too, but we're just concentrating on ovarian here. And so that's an incredibly valuable resource to consider if you can identify markers of risk for ovarian cancer. Earlier diagnosis, better outcome in ovarian and other diseases, obviously. Uh, so we have two papers out on that and a third which has been submitted. What we did was to use our mass spectrometry platform to identify 
potential biomarkers that were going to tell us about risk of ovarian cancer. And these samples go back from, uh, go back to about three or four years prior to diagnosis. And I, I am extremely encouraged by the data that we have generated. We do have novel risk models for early detection and screening of ovarian cancer. We get back to the big issue in all of this kind of work, which is where's the, where's the latest pipeline blockage? If you free up this part of the pipeline, where does it get blocked next? And I think the big issue now with what we have done here is verification. So um, that is where we want to move to next. We have a combined biomarker panel. This is proteins, as I inferred. Um, that show improved sensitivity for the early detection of ovarian cancer. The, the, the place where we need to go is to algorithms which, which are um, technique ag agnostic. Obviously, I, I don't think early stage cancers are going to be throwing out too many circulating tumor cells, but possibly there is nucleic acid-based material to be found in these samples which could be of value, and that is something that other groups are investigating. An algorithm can consist of many different components in order to come to an ability to take an informed clinical decision. And there we can see that the new algorithm outcompetes the uh, Rocker algorithm that is presently available. And what we did there was to use discovery mass spectroscopy followed by selected reaction mo monitoring. And then, as I said, what we did was move to ELISA assays for the simple reason that we wanted this to be tractable and usable by other laboratories. So the, the next piece of um, work that I want to talk about was work with Tessa Holyoke in Glasgow. So... We had a couple of program grants to look at the chronic myeloid leukemia stem cell, and I'll tell you why we did that in a minute. The bottom line, the key point from this slide is that um, we can kill chronic myeloid leukemia stem cells in mice, and we can kill them in a test tube. Now it would be, uh, I think Tessa's, yeah, she did, about a week ago, the grant to um, perform a clinical trial based on this paper, was submitted to CRUK. So um, this is hemopoiesis, which is a beautiful, beautiful cellular system. And at its top, you have the stem cells that give rise to all of these different blood cells. And it's extremely dynamic. You're producing billions of red blood cells, for example, every minute. And you'll find that in chronic myeloid leukemia and other diseases, uh, other uh, malignant diseases, it's these stem cells that are, um, that are the issue. You have to wipe them out. And this is the history of chronic myeloid leukemia treatment. And here's, here's a bunch of one-size-fits-all stuff until you get to bone marrow transplantation. And then we get to the game-changer that came from the work of Brian Drucker and others, uh, working with Novartis, where... Imatinib, which targets the um, molecular hallmark of chronic myeloid leukemia, which is the chimeric bcr able gene product, which is a tyrosine kinase. So you inhibit the tyrosine kinase, and you can manage the disease pretty effectively. That's fine, but the patients have to keep taking the drug. So you have patients taking tyrosine kinase inhibitors who become drug resistant, you have side effects, you have some patients who don't respond to the drug, it costs 40 to 70,000 euros a year, and it, the disease can reappear if you stop taking the drug. So you manage it, but you, you don't cure it, and, and that has um, issues for the patient, and uh, it has issues in terms of the NHS budget. So what we wanted to do was to find what was different between a chronic myeloid leukemia cell, a uh, stem cell, I should say, and, uh, and an apparently normal, healthy, hemopoietic uh, stem cell. 
and we use proteomics to do that. And here we get to high-end informatics, which was done by Lisa Hopcroft in, in, in Glasgow. And by looking at the differences between chronic myeloid leukemia stem cells and normal stem cells, you come up with two nodes, P53 and MYC, which are different between those two populations. And that means that we're developing drug targets and there are drugs that are available to target MYC inhibition and P53 activation, which is what we want to do in this case. And all of this came from relative quantification mass spectrometry. So chronic myeloid leukemia is a fine example of stratified medicine. You look for the T922 translocation, you look for BCR able gene expression, and then you give them a drug that targets the BCR able, but it's still not good enough. That's why we went to this next level. And you have to validate your proteome observations. You can do that with um, Western blots, or you can do it with um, microscopy. Whatever the TEP method you use, validation is important. And then you need to actually observe whether you get this, these kinds of effects on, on human CML cells. You can do that in soft gel colony forming assays, you can do it in xenografts, or you can, the other way that the reviewers asked us to do it was to use an animal model of BCR able driven disease in a mouse, an inducible BCR able. And um, the fact is that in these kinds of circumstances, what we are able to do is to wipe out the leukemic clone by using a combination of drugs that target MYC inhibition and P53 activation. So that's why we're on the point of um, Tessa sending off a, a grant as PI to um, CRUK to try and deal with these pesky stem cells that sit in the bone marrow and don't get killed by imatinib and tyrosine kinase inhibitors for once and for all. And that will have patient benefit because they don't like taking their drugs. They do not comply. They take holidays. It was a really nice study with a, a smart lid to their, uh, to their um, drug pot. And um, yeah, when they get near a con uh, an appointment with their clinician, they start taking five a day. But then they've had a holiday for a week before that. So, you know, this is... <laughs> cure is obviously better than management, is what I'm saying. So, what we can say then is proteomics uh, led us to a way to selectively kill stem cells, and uh, we wish to take that forward for the patient benefit and also because it will have health economic benefits as well which um, stratified and precision medicine has to consider, obviously. And that uh, is actually the last slide that I want to present. So um, what I didn't do was put a list of collaborators and the people in my lab up. So that's a failure on my part. I'd just like to thank uh, the people that I've worked with, especially Tessa, because she's fantastic, Caroline Dive in, um, uh, at the Christie Hospital site, and... Um, Andrew Pierce, who works in my group and manages most of it. So, thank you.